This is Resilience Quest. It's a game show where players journey to dystopian futures to confront worst-case scenarios. The city has been bombed into submission and may soon be invaded by a foreign power. So teams, the morale is extremely low here and few are willing to fight. Do I feel a sense of belonging? Do I feel that I am Singaporean? I'm just hoping that we'll be able to go through this together. Stressed. They then travel back in time to champion ways to prepare their city for calamity. The team's arguments will be scored by a panel of experts. It's a meeting of minds and a battle of wits to protect Singapore's future. Welcome aboard our time machine. I'm your game master, Yvonne Chan. Let's meet our travelers. From the team in green, we have Joel Lim. Joel is the host of Political Prude, a podcast about politics and current affairs for young adults. Next, we have Shazli Zain. He is a public policy researcher focusing on geopolitics and international affairs. And their team captain is radio personality, Azura Go. Azura, what's your team name for our journey today? We're called the Triple C. Triple C's, is it related to vitamins? Not exactly, a little bit maybe. Tell us. Because we are the Cosmic, Cosmic Chlorophyll, Chlorophyll Crew. Crew. Cosmic Chlorophyll Crew, I will stick to Triple C. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Uh, let's go to the team in blue now. We have Martin Modari, a youth leader committed to helping Singapore's underserved youths. And then we have Rachel Jui, co-author of several global risk reports with a keen interest in public policy. And their team captain is content creator and early childhood educator, Samantha Tan. <laughs> Samantha, what's your team name for today? We are Team Tenacity. Oh, I like that. Team Tenacity, <laughs> welcome, and Team Triple C. And in this episode, we're discussing national resilience, covering topics such as defense, national identity, and governance. And our first scenario has to do with national defense. Eve, take us there. The year is 2045. In this alternate future, the Indo-Pacific has become a battleground where great powers clash in open warfare. Singapore faces severe penalties for its neutrality in the war. Powerful nations enforce blockades, sanctions and military threats to coerce the city-state into supporting them. And they also conduct covert operations and influence campaigns aiming to divide society. Now, these actions are shattering Singapore's economy, security and social cohesion. Any comments? I think inevitably in some situations we do need to pick a side but it is difficult to pick what is the right side and the wrong side. In such situations it's quite complex so you want to preserve all options on the table. I think it's also about building resilience in our supply chains to make sure that we can navigate these challenges. As we know over the past few years US-China geopolitical tensions have been rising over issues like uh, Taiwan and certainly the South China Sea. So in this sense, this scenario is uh, very much something which is a reasonable extrapolation from the current situation. I think we're seeing a fair bit of contestation, not just in the real world, but in the digital world as well, where countries are trying to assert their sovereignty in the digital space, what we call sure. digital sovereignty. Yeah. Scenarios we see like this are actually probably just 10% of what's happening behind the scenes, right? 90% mm. be behind the scenes, digital warfare and things like that. I think it's really tiny to talk about this because this year, Singapore celebrates 40th anniversary of total defence. That's right. Now, this version of Singapore hadn't built up enough resilience to bounce back in a global conflict, but we can prepare for it by going back in time. So, Eve, please take us there. Beware. Travelling backwards in time is complex. Answering questions about your destination will help me navigate to your version of Singapore with time to spare. Well, every correct answer is worth three points. And if you answer all questions correctly, 
Each team will be awarded one bonus point. Okay, I saw Joe smiling eagerly there. I think he's ready, ready to for this. Some points. Are you guys ready? Triple C and yes. Team Tenacity. Yes, yes. 100%. Yeah. Okay, let's bring on the first question. Listen carefully. According to the Ministry of Defense, what are the twin pillars of Singapore's defense policy? Three options. A, is it innovation and technology? B, deterrence and diplomacy? Or is it C, strength and alliances? Just 10 seconds to choose an answer. But it does look like your eyes are ready, so please reveal your answers to me. It's B, chosen by both teams, and Eve will now tell us what's the correct answer. The answer is B. According to the Ministry of Defense, Singapore's defense policy is based on the twin pillars of deterrence and diplomacy. That's right, so well done team. Three points awarded to each. Let's move on to the second question. Singapore's Foreign Interference Countermeasures Act, or FICA, was passed by Parliament in October 2021. When did this act come fully into force? You have three options there. A, 29th December 2021, B, 29th December 2022, or is it C, 29th December 2023? Once again, you have 10 seconds to make a group decision. About, like, the point about including women in international service. That's good. I think, I think it's good. We have 10 seconds to be said about. What do you guys think about you ready? Well, 10 seconds is up. Please reveal your answers. Again, it's B, <laughs> chosen by both teams. Let's see if this time they're correct. Eve? The answer is C, December 29th, 2023. The act authorizes the blocking of online content to counter foreign interference and requires key political figures to disclose foreign affiliations. Okay, we have one more question for you guys to not end this in a tie. Okay. Let's see. <laughs> the ASEAN Defence Minister's Meeting is the top defence dialogue and cooperation forum in Southeast Asia. When was it established? Three options once again. A, 1986. B, 1996. Or is it C, 2006? Ten seconds to choose one answer. Good luck. <laughs> They look like they are ready. 10 seconds on the clock. Please reveal your answers. B for Team Tenacity, C for Team Triple C. Eve, tell us what's the correct answer for this one. The answer is C, 2006. The forum is focused on tackling security challenges and maintaining regional stability. So Team Triple C, you've answered two questions correctly, giving you six points. And Team Tenacity, you've answered one question correctly, giving you three points. So Team Triple C, you're in the lead for this round. Well done. And let's go to Eve because we are going to time travel. Welcome to the year 2024. Here's your chance to find a way to build Singapore's resilience to tackle this challenge. And I've set up calls with two experts offering different strategies, so listen up. Hi, travelers. I present to you Harmony Coalition. It aims to enhance Singapore's security and prosperity by promoting regional neutrality, encouraging reporting of sovereignty violations, strengthening global and regional economic ties, developing resilient supply chains for crises, and advocating international diplomacy and military cooperation, ensuring a stable and thriving future for the nation. Hello team, let me introduce National Unity Plus. It focuses on reinforcing shared values and national identity, combating foreign interference and disinformation, improving public media literacy to resist manipulation, and fostering respectful dialogue on resolving world conflicts. Team Triple C, you've heard two solutions, Harmony Coalition and National Unity Plus. I would like you to carefully consider each solution, weighing them up for their pros and cons, share your analysis of that, and then explain which solution your team will be championing and why. You'll be given five minutes to discuss this, and your time starts now. Okay, so maybe this one, like, it's a war. <laughs> yeah. I think they're picking this card. For card one, uh, Harmony Coalition, some of the 
propose policy measures that do make sense. It is very important uh, in order to ensure freedom of action for Singapore. Part of it involves international measures as well. Uh, for example, promoting international diplomacy, military collaboration. For small states like Singapore, that is also very going to be very, very important. I think in situations of war, uh, to me, internal unity becomes actually very critical. Mm. So Singapore society is becoming increasingly more diverse. To me, it's also about internal players coming together uh, to be as unified as possible to, to sort of project that sort of resilience. So I, I'm, I'm really torn. Uh, I wouldn't even want Triple C, your discussion time is over. Each of you will now be given one minute to present. Now, I must let you know that you'll be judged by a panel of experts who will reward you based on the clarity of your argument, the accuracy of the evidence presented, and overall, how engaging or memorable or smooth your delivery is going to be. So are you ready, Triple C? Yeah, we are. Yep. Quiet confidence there, I like <laughs> that. Who will be presenting first? It will be me. Okay, so take it away, Shaz. Thank you very much. I think having looked at both the Harmony Coalition and the National Unity Plus, we've decided to go ahead with the Harmony Coalition, a little bit more macro, a little bit more external. And this is sort of building up from the current framework that we already have. As you know, Singapore in Southeast Asia, we are one of the important leaders within the ASEAN framework. So the ASEAN framework, not only does it look at things from a geopolitical perspective, but we have things like the ASEAN Plus. So where we invite regional partners to sort of come in and be part of the region to some extent to do economic integration, political integration, and just generally, you know, promoting good vibes within the region. And that's quite important. ASEAN is a very diverse region, and we do need to have some degree of shared values and shared, you know, commonalities, if you will. And this is why through things like ASEAN Plus or through AFTA, which is the free trade agreement within ASEAN and the Economic uh, Commission, these sort of things sort of help to bring us all together. Why should we go to Your work time together? is up, Thank Shaz. You. Thank you. Let's move on to our next presenter, Azura. Okay, so I think Singapore has always understand that we need to build resilience, not just within our country, um, but with other countries as well. I think Singapore will always stick the side of Singapore. People think that we're neutral. People think that we try and make friends with everybody and you know take a neutral stand on most things but we will always stand with the side of Singapore where it's on our interests and um, I think that is why uh, we've got to look at it at a global scale because as we know um, we don't have very much resources within us and our best resource is our people so that's why I think that's what we've always been going for and the framework here is to build on the deterrence and diplomacy as we've mentioned that so that is what we're looking at and I think at the same time as well why we've you know passed on card 2 which is um, National Unity Plus it's not that it's not important but that's a little bit more intrinsic where it's inside and in a situation like 2045 Time is up Azura <laughs> but perhaps Joel can flesh yeah, that absolutely. out a bit more so when we look at National Unity Plus, we think that it's incredibly important. But when we're talking about war, it's something heightened, it's something macro scale. So we're looking at something larger in scale. And that's why we chose the Harmony Coalition. And I want to bring everybody back to the movie Avengers Endgame. Now you know that Captain America was struggling on his own, right? But when all the different Avengers came together, they actually defeated one common enemy, which is Thanos. So if we have that in mind, basically we're looking at war in a regional level and we have Singapore partnering up with all these different neighbours uh, with this Harmony Coalition going against a common threat. And we see the power in strength and power in unity in the region. And with that, I think I, I would like to explain why uh, Harmony Coalition is important to us because we see that when we work together with our neighbours, we can actually come together, put our differences aside and actually come through and triumph. So I like the fact that they acknowledge um, the power of a collective. Mm. So the metaphor of uh, Avengers Endgame, mm. I think really, really struck a chord with me. Mm. Um, I also appreciated the fact that they acknowledge the diversity mm. of the region mm. of ASEAN. On what Azura mentioned about Singapore will always take the side of Singapore, I appreciate that, but I think there's more Singapore can do in the region, mm. in the space of misinformation and disinformation. Mm. We observe that many countries in the region actually look to what Singapore is doing. Actually, on reflection, the team's choice of uh, national, uh, the sort of harmony collision actually makes me quite happy because it tells me that our, our young thinkers are actually thinking about multilateralism. 
Team Triple C, here's what the judges have to say. They thought that having to choose just one card is really a tough decision. They would have liked for you to also mention other international blocks, such as the European Union. Okay, so something to keep in mind. But with that said, the judges have awarded you 59 points out of a possible 90 points. So well done, Team Triple C. Keep that up, guys. Coming up next on Resilience Quest, we'll see how the other team, Team Tenacity, take on a looming invasion. Welcome back to Resilience Quest. It's time for Team Tenacity to take on another challenge to our future defense systems. Ready yourselves for the journey? Yep. Ooh, Eve, take us there. The year is 2045. In an alternate version of Singapore, the city has been bombed into submission and may soon be invaded by a foreign power. So teams, the morale is extremely low here and few are willing to fight. Many conscripts have fled as they feel no loyalty to this global city with a very weak national identity. Meanwhile, citizens make up only half of the population and some residents even want to welcome the invaders as liberators. Now, what would you do in such a situation? Samantha. I'm just hoping that Singapore really invests in our youth and that when time comes, when this happens, hopefully not, uh, really hopefully not, uh, we'll be able to go through this together as one nation. I think one of the more practical realities is that Singapore is a global city. People will move, but it is a question of, is Singapore home? Do I feel a sense of belonging? Do I feel that I am Singaporean? I think that's a very important question to ask. One of the big challenges for a country like Singapore is how to remain globalised, but at the same time, how to ensure our citizens, both new and old, remain deeply rooted to the nations. At first glance, it seems like a doomsday scenario. Mm. But I think if we look at the kind of political developments that are happening in other parts of the world, it is actually plausible. More importantly, we also see in countries where increasingly the politics are becoming more and more polarised. So I think these are um, really key uh, threats. So the crux for me really uh, for this scenario is how do we strengthen the glue between people and government but also how do we strengthen the glue among people. That's right. to, to me diversity is a strength. How can we tap the diversity, promote the diversity but not let diversity come in the way when it comes to national resilience and national That's unity. Right. Absolutely important. And I'm really interested to hear and see what Singapore could do to prepare for this crisis. So, Eve, shall we go back now? Beware. Traveling backwards in time is complex. Answering questions about your destination will help us navigate through the multiverse to your version of Singapore with time to spare. Teams, you know the drill here. Every correct answer gets you three points. And if you answer all questions correctly, a bonus point will be awarded to each of you. Triple C, Tenacity, are you ready to play? Yes! Yeah! Right, let's go. Bring up the first question, please. In the Battle of Singapore, roughly how many more troops did the British have compared to the Japanese? Was it A, 10,000 more, B, roughly 30,000 more, or C, 50,000 more? 10 seconds starts now. <laughs> And time's up. Please decide an answer. Reveal your answers to me. A for tenacity, B for triple C. Eve, show us the correct answer. The answer is C. <laughs> Despite having about 50,000 more soldiers than the Japanese, the British surrendered Singapore on February 15, 1942. Let's move to the second question. There's still time to gain some points. In 1966, then Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew suggested Singapore had to be like a certain kind of animal to defend itself. Now, what animal was he referring to? We have three interesting options. A, a lion, B, a dolphin, or is it C, a 
a shrimp. Ten seconds. Ten seconds. Please decide. Yeah, I'm ready. We have ten seconds. Let's go. Let's go. Yes. Time's up. <laughs> Reveal your answers at the same time, please. A, A, you chose lion. Eve, tell us the correct answer. The answer is C. Lee Kuan Yew suggested Singapore had to be like a poisonous shrimp to avoid being swallowed by larger nations. So no points awarded to either team. Now we're going to go to the final question. Through national service, Singaporean males are conscripted into uniformed services like the military, the police and civil defense. In which year did Singapore enlist its first batch of national servicemen? Three options once again. A, 1954, B, 1965, C, 1967. I'm hoping our Singaporeans don't get this wrong. 10 seconds to choose an answer. Joel, you look confident. We, we studied for this, babe. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay, time's up. Let's see your answer. It's C for both teams. Eve, is that correct? The answer is C. Yay. 1967. <laughs> In August 1967, a pioneer batch of around 9,000 Singaporean youths were enlisted in the army. It's time to reveal your scores for this trivia round. Team Triple C, do you know what you've got? Okay, you answered one question yeah, correctly, yeah. giving you three points. Woo! Okay. And Team Tenacity, also answering one question correctly, getting three points. So it's a tie for the second trivia round. We'll take it, we'll take it, we'll take it. Eve, it's time to go. Welcome to Singapore in the year 2024. How can the nation build up its resilience to invasions? Well, we've arranged calls with two experts who will present to you two different strategies, so listen carefully. Hello. My solution, Singapore United, strengthens national unity by refreshing education on national identity, combating disinformation, encouraging intercultural bonding, and expanding national service to include women, first-generation citizens, and permanent residents, fostering a more cohesive and resilient society. Pay attention team. I call my solution Fortress Singapore. It focuses on fortifying national defense by investing in advanced military technology and training, preparing civilians for emergencies, enhancing infrastructure resilience, and strengthening global military alliances through joint exercises. Well, you've heard two solutions, Singapore United and Fortress Singapore. So weigh them up, share with us your pros and cons of both solutions, and then explain which solution your team will be championing and why. You know, time is ticking for this one. Your five minutes of discussion time starts right now. Sure. Do you... Okay, so... You... Preparedness. Preparedness. So if we look at the first card, Singapore United, uh, this particular solution actually speaks on the need to strengthen social glue between government and people and also the need to strengthen social glue among different communities in society. The point about expanding national service to all is interesting. Uh, and in fact, of course, women do serve national service in other countries. To me, it's a software, but this... Uh, and in fact, the software is needed to ensure that Fortress Singapore becomes effective because you can have uh, all these uh, advanced military tech and training, but this is not done by uh, machines. To me, the choice is between uh, whether you build the hardware, uh, which is Singapore United, or you focus a bit more on the hardware, right? Which is really that Fortress Singapore perspective. So it's really a, a difficult choice. Tenacity, your discussion time is over. Please put all your pens down. Each of you will now be given one minute to present. So who will be presenting first? I'll, I'll be going first. All right, Samantha, yes. take it away. All right, so our team decided on Fortress Singapore to anchor on the element of deterrence. Yeah, we want to avoid combat at all costs as much as possible to prevent invasion from happening. And CART 2 provides us with a more holistic approach to working towards that. And it also includes elements which talks about national readiness and leans towards civilian resilience to tackle invasion. So my teammates will be sharing more about policies that are aligned to Fortress Singapore and also concluding with what good would look like. 
All right, excellent. Thank you, Samantha. Rachel. Yes, okay, so the two parts of our answer about what kind of policies we would propose, we've got on one hand the um, leading into social resilience and then on the other hand physical and technological resilience. So just to start on social resilience, you know, when we say building a fortress, it's not just about the physical infrastructure, it's also about the mentality that we sort of um, uh, approach this with. So social resilience means preparing civilians for disasters, having that readiness and, and that mindset to be able to do this. Um, a lot of cities around the world actually have been looking into community-led initiatives for this kind of resilience. Uh, Austin, Texas being one of them, they have a community resilience hub which taps on civilians and uh, local businesses to provide first aid and basic responses when disaster strikes. So that's absolutely something that we can do. Uh, as for physical and technological resilience, uh, misinformation and disinformation are definitely some of the biggest threats and risks to our society right now. I'll have to stop you there, Rachel, okay. but it seems like uh, you know, you're looking at a very holistic or comprehensive fortress of Singapore touching on the various arms of physical, uh, social, and technological resilience. Let's have Martin wrap it up for us then. Um, thank you. So um, I think for me, it's uh, for us, I'm representing this in regards to what does good look like for us. Uh, three points I would like to make. Um, the first is that we have the right capabilities to defend ourselves, um, which means everyone treats those things very seriously. Um, the second one is that obviously we are resource constrained, we are also a very small market. Um, being able to have friends and allies around the world that can help us and complement this effort of defence is definitely going to be helpful. Um, and the third one is at the societal level, I think what good looks like for us is that when the, the test fi finally comes, uh, we have the muscles that have been activated and stress tests over the years uh, to be able to address some of these things. So for instance, uh, with regards to digital information, um, where we are able to, as a society, check the veracity of sources and kind of discern that and what that means to us. So I think these are the three things of like, what good looks like to us with regards to the response to Fortress Singapore. I felt uh, that Martin's use of analogy was very good uh, because he mentioned that um, these are muscles that we need to flex uh, in adversity and these muscles can only function well when it has been training for a long time. Uh, but overall, I think um, the team did well but could go further, talk a little bit more about how Fortress Singapore, for example, uh, this, this focus on, on, on the hardware uh, is, is actually more critical than developing the hardware. Rachel mentioned um, technological or technical resilience, which I thought she could have expanded a little bit on. And linked to that, if Martin could have talked about um, developing, say, what are the right capabilities, right? So that was a little unclear to me. I was quite impressed that essentially, as a whole, they, they grasped uh, what the scenario was uh, about and they, you know, they presented their views uh, coherently. Team Tenacity, the judge's verdict is in. So the judges would have preferred if you kept it just a little more concise and provided further developments to each point. Okay, so bear that in mind as we move into the final round. Uh, but overall, the judges thought you did really well and they've awarded you 58 points out of a possible 90. Well done. Thank you. Well done, Team Tenacity. So we're going to move to the final round now, which could decide our winners as both teams will go head to head in a debate about an alternate Singapore that's governed by a corrupt prime minister. Welcome to the final act in this episode of Resilience Quest. At last, both teams will get to debate with each other. Are you ready, Team Triple C and Tenacity? Yes! Loving the energy? And right now, it's time for me to reveal your current score tally. Team Triple C, you have a total of 68 points. And Team Tenacity, right now you've accumulated 64 points, which means Team Triple C, you're in the lead. But hold up. This decisive final round is worth up to 150 points and it could be your chance to turn things around. So our last future worst case scenario has to do with governance. Eve, take us there. This alternate Singapore is set in 2065 
A charismatic but corrupt head of government has come to power after people grew frustrated with the complications of democracy and debate. Under authoritarian rule, key institutions like the Anti-Corruption Bureau, the Elections Department, the Justice System, and the Internal Security Department are co-opted to suppress dissent and maintain power. What do you make of such a scenario? Is it even plausible? Martin? Personally, I don't think we should rule out such a possibility. I think so far, in terms of the trends, we've seen a greater de deal of uh, pluralism in Singapore. So I'm hoping that trend continues and not this. I think it's about how to have productive conversations about differences and not letting it escalate to the point where there might be violence or you know where dissent is quashed. We do see uh, how societies, countries that are facing uh, economic distress, economic downturn, turned against, for example, uh, globalization, which has given rise to support for you know what uh, some scholars would call authoritarian populism. So you see strong leaders which claim to be defending the rights of the uh, dominant communities arising, you know, uh, and we see this uh, quite uh, common phenomenon around the world. For example, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Orban in Hungary, Donald Trump's election in uh, 2016. So, I mean, Singapore is part of the world. We are very much uh, part of this uh, global forces. It's not something that can be entirely ruled out. So if we look at the given scenario, it seems almost impossible given that our politics in Singapore compared to many countries have been relatively smooth um, and uh, uneventful. Um, and there have been many checks and balances that's put in place within the system to protect the system to, uh, to protect the people from, uh, for instance, corruption or uh, the tyranny of minority or tyranny of a particular individual. I think um, that said, we should not rest on our laurels. I think current government is also saying, um, highlighting the possibility of a rogue government or rogue officials. So certainly, we need to think about these issues. I think to, to me, nothing happens overnight. Right. Uh, getting to this scenario requires a lot of enabling factors. So to me, I'm actually thinking about what are some of these enabling factors uh, to get uh, to that scenario of a corrupt leader. And I'm thinking uh, which card actually helps decrease the risk of these enabling scenarios. So what exactly could we have done to prevent this corrupt leader from gaining so much power unchecked? Eve, let's go back in time. Welcome to the year 2024. To have more resilient governance in the future, we need to put more checks and balances in place now. And I've arranged calls with experts who will present to you two different strategies. So listen carefully. Hi, travelers. I propose we empower institutional independence. Empower Institutional Independence seeks to enhance Singapore's governance by boosting the Corrupt Practices Investigation Bureau's autonomy, increasing transparency in the Elections Department, expanding presidential oversight, and strengthening the judiciary's independence and its oversight of the Internal Security Act. I say we empower civil society. This strategy focuses on educating citizens for active democratic participation, engaging civil society in policy shaping, strengthening community organizations for government accountability, and empowering media to maintain an informed citizenry, enhancing transparency and civic involvement in governance. Two very different solutions there, empower civil society and empower institutional independence. And since uh, Team Triple C, you scored higher in the previous rounds, you get to choose which solution card you want to champion first. Just 10 seconds to pick one. And your time is up. Please tell us which solution card you will be championing. 
we will be picking card one. All right, so card one, Empower Institutional Independence will be championed by Team Triple C, and that means Team Tenacity. You will be championing card two, Empowering Civil Society. Unlike earlier rounds, you'll get to critique each other's presentations in a rebuttal, and you'll have a total of seven minutes to discuss how to pitch your solutions and prep for a rebuttal. Your time begins now. There's always uh, you know, political developments downstream nobody can predict. So that's why it's important to be wary and cautious, which is why the second part about empowering civil society is also important. I mean, uh, successful societies that are resilient do not depend just on government machinery, but also a strong active citizenry who are engaged in various ways. The weakness of the institutions uh, probably need to be in place for things like that to happen. So for me, I'm a little bit more inclined uh, towards uh, empowering institutional independence. They have the mandate. They have the mandate. Teams, yep. your discussion so you time is up. I hope you're ready to present. Let me come to Team Triple C. Are you ready? I think so. As ready as <laughs> you'll ever be. Your two minutes then starts right now. All right, when we look at the um, card one of Empower Institutional Independence, I think what's more important is that we want to power, we want to package it together with public education because we believe that yes, in, we can definitely increase the independence and also the um, uh, overall independence of like the different systems in place but what we need is actually the people to also like believe in the systems and also understand why things are happening in, in that way so with that in mind we'll go through the three different points that we want to present today so the first one being the separation of powers uh, with regards to the CPIB the Corrupt Practices Investigation Bureau uh, so it is a, already a system in place that we see uh, can work on its own right so when we when we say that we want to increase the independence of it perhaps we can have the CPIB also report to independent commissions um, but as I mentioned it is also important that we pair it up with public education so in this case um, we wanted to uh, basically have people understand um, that it is actually two separate entities when we look at CPIB versus you know like people in power yeah maybe Azari you can go to a second point yeah so just to drive the point that Joel has made home, um, public education, when we speak about that, because I think we've gotten ourselves in this situation of a corrupt prime minister because of impulsive decisions, you know. Sometimes people tend to think that the grass is greener on the other side, but I think we've learned that the grass is greener where you water it. And we've seen this happen with Brexit even before this, where everybody just wanted out in the UK. And when that happened, you know, they were unhappy again about it. And there was a lot of regret in that decision. So I think this is what we've landed ourselves into right now. And I think, um, what Joel said about CPIB. So basically, I think public education also means that people need to know what is going on there, um, which also means that right now, CPIB, as much as you know, they report to the Prime Minister, but they don't need um, authority and mandate. They have the authority and the mandate to do what is necessary, despite of whoever it is in question. Right bang on the dot. Good job, Azura and Joel. So empowering institutional independence, but packaging it really tightly with public education. So really focused effort there. Thank you. Now, Team Tenacity, are you ready for your rebuttal? Oh, yeah, sure. You have I a am. minute? Let's go. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so firstly, I think uh, there are a couple of things to be challenged here. The first is institutions at the end of the day are still run by people. And, you know, well, Singapore is very, very small. If corruption happens at the top, chances are it has, been, it has already been permeated throughout our broader society. The second one is that just because you're independent doesn't mean you act in the best interest of the public. That's a major assumption that we're making. And this is why our proposal will be with regards to empowering civil society comes in. Because when, only when the citizens are empowered to be able to make some of these things happen, then that's where the challenge happens. Uh, that's where then the pressure takes place and you can see broad reforms that happens uh, at, at the national level. Yeah, those will be my rebuttals. Two points. You still have Short. some time left of the clock. Anything else you want to add? No, we'll keep it tight. Just on these two main points, that number one, the institutions are still run by people. The second one is that just because you're independent does not mean that you act in the best interest of the public. I thought delivery was really good. But I wasn't so clear about how, uh, how public education, while it's an important point, fit into this idea of empowering uh, institutional independence. So to me, that 
link was that the story uh, was, was not very well told. Their suggestion of how to increase CPIB's independence wasn't exactly clear to me, so I thought that could have been better fleshed out. And when we come back, it's time for Team Tenacity to present their solution on empowering civil society. Stay with us. Welcome back to Resilience Quest. We're in the middle of the final act. A team Triple C has presented their solution and it's now time for Team Tenacity to present their solution card on empowering civil society. Team Tenacity, are you ready for this final round? Yes. Yep. Your time starts right now, two minutes. All right, we are championing cut to empowering a civil society. So with that, it's really all about the people, motivating them to engage in discussion, initiating discussion. So how are we going to do that? Rachel's going to share more with us. All right, so I have two policies that are going to be effective. First of all, we think that engaging youth is really, really important. So definitely, um, Team Triple C was onto something when they were talking about education. Early years and intervening early can help to build that sort of emotional and political literacy that is absolutely critical to helping people question some of the information that they're given. Um, encouraging youth to engage in community um, uh, associations are also really important to building that care and compassion for fellow Singaporeans and for the country overall to care about participating in the po uh, political arena. Um, and then finally, we have the diversification of media sources. We think it's really important also to have different types of information being presented to Singaporeans, not fake information, not false information, but different sources so that people are able to start to critique some information and build that, that sort Legitimate. of muscle, exactly that muscle that, that they need to you know, be able to hold uh, discussions and uh, engage. Yes, and this brings us back to how we are as people. So I was reminded of my, uh, my university slogan, we, we have hit, heart and habit. So with hit, Earliest and emotional literacy, political literacy can help us with our heads. And then for our hearts, it's about community care. And then with have it goes back to the muscles that, uh, that Mother was talking about. Uh, it has to be conditioned and this conditioning will come with all of our policies that we have just proposed. And with that, from a very young age, we start to become conditioned to become vigilant citizens, empowered, to create this very wonderful civil society and that will eventually become instinctual for us. The time is up. Also, another one finishing the discussion. Bang on time. Team Triple C, you ready with your rebuttal? I hope so. Shaz, you look ready. <laughs> it's not really a rebuttal, just more comments. A comment. Mm. Okay then, your one minute starts now. I think one of the the things to be praised is about empowering civil society. But I do think at the same time, we need to be realistic with the fact that can civil society have the power necessary to overcome structural issues that, that or structural powers, I would say, in terms of like what are the existing sort of political structures. One of the other issues, we have seen examples of civil society attempting to overcome corrupt uh, so institutions and problems, such as Hong Kong, where unfortunately it did fail in that particular scenario. And the final thing I do want to mention is that as much as we do preach a lot about this cause, in this day and age where information is so easy to change and you know the direction of this course can flip almost uh, immediately. People can hijack this sort of discussion in a way that is inappropriate. We need to be responsible when it comes to how we speak in public and how we speak in civil society before it gets misled. Thank you. There was a certain coherence between the two presenters, uh, Rachel and Samantha, and they said that you need, you need to start it, start it young. I think it's a very, that's a very, very good point. It's very, very important. We want to build a strong, active and responsible civil society. These values need to be inculcated from young. I felt that the team tenacity spoke with a lot of conviction. Uh, they also had the substance to, to, to back them up. I think they talked about the importance of political literacy and uh, that addresses to some extent uh, political apathy in a way. But I felt um, <clears throat> This, this idea of uh, youth engagement and political literacy needs to be nuanced a little bit. I like the fact that um, they were very well-rounded in terms of their approach. Also, they highlighted the importance um, that media plays, right? And not just 
the importance of media, but also the importance of quality information, which is really very important for a thriving public sphere, uh, a place ideally where people have access to different perspectives, different sources of information to help them arrive at more informed decision making with regards to, say, um, policy decisions. And of course, they rounded up their rally call to empower civil society by a very um, succinct, punchy headline, Head, Heart and Habit. Teams, the judge's verdict is in. First up, they like that both the teams took very holistic approaches when pitching their solution. Uh, but in the end, it was one team that had a more impassioned delivery that was the deciding factor for the judges. Team Triple C, you scored 56 points for your pitch and 37 points for your rebuttal for a total of 93 points in the final round. Congratulations. Well done. And coming to Team Tenacity, scoring 66 points for your pitch and 37 for your rebuttal for a total of 103 in the final round. Yes. Well done. So putting that all together, Team Triple C, you've earned for yourselves today 161 points and Team Tenacity 167 points, which makes Team Tenacity our Yay. overall winner. <laughs> well done. Well done and great jobs to both teams. And we've learned a lot from this journey on national resilience. And what an amazing voyage this has been. And we're so glad to have you here journeying with us. This is Resilience Quest signing off. Um, there are definitely merits and demerits to any sort of plan. I think the most important thing is to maintain that level of ability to engage with other people, decide as a society, as a community, what we can do better to make our cities more resilient. I think the biggest takeaway for me is that I think that the solutions to tomorrow's problems need to be intentionally cultivated today. What both teams have done is to highlight the internal and external challenges that Singapore faces and will continue to face, probably to a larger magnitude, and what needs to be done at all levels.